started. Uh, Richard Townley will talk to you about the uh, opportunity mission. I have to go home and wipe this deal. Uh, before I start, is this microphone functional for you, or do I have to pin this to myself, or what do I do? <laughs> All right, testing, testing, one, two, three. All right, I guess I'll just I guess I'll just hold this up and talk into it. Well, Let's see if there's a. There we go. All right, looks kind of weird, but whatever, we'll roll with it. All right, so uh, today I'm going to talk to you about the Opportunity mission. Uh, Opportunity was a rover that was active on the surface of Mars from 2004 to 2018. And uh, as you can see, our screen projector um, is a bit technically limited. Uh, the title of my talk is actually projected uh, back there behind the actual screen. So um, I guess we're just going to have to work with that. But uh, anyway, before I talk about the Opportunity mission, first I should turn off the lights. Let me get to that right now. So you can see that a bit better. There we go. So um, before I talk about opportunity, though, what I was going to say is I want to talk a bit about some of the past um, missions that have gone to uh, Mars. And also, I need to find my note cards. I think I left them right over there, maybe. Maybe. Nope. OK. Let me look for them over here, then. I'm sure I put them up. Ah, found it. OK. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk a bit about some of the past missions that have gone to Mars. Um, and I should, I should preface this as well by saying um, there have been a lot of them, and about two-thirds of the missions that have gone to Mars have failed in some way or another. So I'm just going to very briefly go over some of the most successful ones. This is by no means a comprehensive list. But um, Mars exploration so far, um, there was the Mariner 4 probe, which was a flyby of the planet Mars. That flew by Mars in 1965. That was the first one that actually successfully flew by the planet and took pictures and sent them back. There were a few other attempts, but uh, they all failed. But uh, Mariner 4, that was the first one to fly by and successfully take pictures of Mars. There was Mariner 9 in 1971, which was the first probe that actually went into orbit around Mars. And of course, since it was orbiting and not just flying by, it sent back quite a lot more pictures and gave us quite a bit more data than uh, Mariner 4 did. Um, there were the Viking landers, Viking 1 and 2, and uh, they arrived at Mars in 1976. And uh, both of these landed on Mars successfully. They touched down, and they were stationary. They didn't rove around or anything like that, but they uh, sort of sat on the surface of Mars for quite a while, uh, returned a lot of very good data on Mars. Um, and then there was, in 1997, the Pathfinder probe. Um, this was a lander, and it carried with it this little thing. Uh, that is a rover called Sojourner, and um, that was the first rover to uh, get on Mars. And it roved around just a little bit, not all that much, about, say, 100 meters or so, just basically sort of scooted around the landing site. But um, all, all four of those missions were very successful, some of the most successful missions uh, up until that point. But uh, at, after Pathfinder, NASA started thinking about yet another mission because, um, uh, well, the Sojourner rover didn't really go all that far. It just basically gave us information right around the landing site. But uh, they thought up another mission concept, and they called it Mars Exploration Rover, uh, the Mars Exploration Rover Program. Um, that headline is also being projected behind the screen there, but whatever. And uh, the objectives of this particular program were, um, hold on one second, I think I have... Um, uh, something has gone wrong with my slides here. Let's see. Okay, no, I think it's good now. Um, the objectives of this, the primary mission, was basically to search for evidence, uh, evidence of past water activity on Mars. Um, it also had a few uh, secondary objectives as well. For example, it would try to determine the composition of any rocks and minerals that it encounters. Um, it would also try to determine some of the past environmental conditions on Mars to see if they could support life. And also, just explore and photograph the Martian surface. Uh, basically, just go around and take pictures of stuff. So um, NASA developed a concept that they would send two rovers, not just one, but two, uh, to the surface of Mars. And they named them Spirit and Opportunity, or rather a 12th grader sent in those names. And they decided to go with that because they sent in the best names, I guess. Um, but this is what um, the rovers would look like. And I'm going to go ahead and show you some of the instruments that they have on the rovers. So that ping pong paddle looking thing over there, that is the high gain antenna. 
Basically, that's a really somewhat powerful uh, antenna that would be used to communicate directly with Earth. And uh, there's a thing that NASA has called the Deep Space Network, which is basically three separate uh, sites on the Earth where they have very large uh, radar, um, uh, I guess, um, receivers and uh, senders, whatever they call dishes. That's what they're called. Um, they have those uh, in three separate places on the Earth. One of them is in Goldstone, California. One of them is in, I believe, Madrid, Spain. And one is somewhere in Australia. I don't remember the city. But basically, the way it works out, say, say it again. Parks? Okay. But uh, basically the way it works out is they are sort of all 120 degrees with respect to each other. So no matter where whatever deep space mission they're trying to talk to is, at least one of them will be pointed sort of in its general direction. So um, the high gain antenna would be used to talk to the deep space network. There's also the low gain antenna, which is that sort of uh, rod over there. Um, that is sort of a less powerful version, but the trade-off is that it's omnidirectional, so it doesn't have to point itself at whatever, uh, point itself at the Earth. It just sort of broadcasts in all directions. But uh, it's lower powered and it can't transmit data quite as quickly. And then there are these two things on the front called the front has cams or hazard cams. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but right in there, uh, there are two cameras and they would be used basically to detect, well, hazards in the rover's way. Like, for example, that rock. If the uh, mission scientist commanded the rover to, say, drive 100 meters in a straight line, well, then the hazard cameras might figure out, oops, there's a rock in the way. We'd better stop and either go around it or just wait for more direction from uh, the uh, mission scientists. But uh, those are the front two. There are also two on the back, which you can't see from this angle. But uh, four hazard cameras in total. And then also up there are some magnets. Uh, there's nothing special about them. They're just magnets on the front there. But uh, they would basically be used to collect magnetic dust, and then the rover could use its arm there to um, analyze that magnetic dust. Now, um, going up to the sort of pole thing over there, that is actually what's called the PanCam Mast Assembly, or PMA. And uh, there are basically a lot of cameras on top here. For example, the two pan cams, which give it its name, those are those two things over there. Uh, those are basically panoramic cameras, so they have a wide field of view. And uh, also, you'll see there's a little wheel in front of the cameras there. That's actually a color filter wheel. Thank you very much. I make use of that a lot. Um, so that is actually a color filter wheel. And uh, basically, there are a bunch of color filters on top there. And they can sort of switch them out and um, basically you know, observe things in different wavelengths. And um, yeah, take some good pictures there. And also, I should, I should mention all of these cameras are grayscale cameras. So for all of the color pictures that you see here, those are all taken using these different filters. Like one would be a red filter, one would be green, one would be blue. And then they'd combine all of those together and uh, form a color image. But those are the two panoramic cameras. Those are the only two that can actually take color pictures. Um, and then there are also these two over here called the nav cams or navigation cameras, which would be used instead of taking pretty pictures, they'd just take pure black and white pictures or rather grayscale pictures. And uh, they would be used to sort of help aid in navigation. So basically, um, they would take pictures with this to see where exactly they want the rover to go next. And then also on the back, you can't see it from here, but there's another instrument called mini tests. And uh, basically, that stands for thermal emission spectrometer. And a spectrometer is basically a device that you use, and you point it at something, and it tells you basically what that, uh, what that thing is made of atomically. And uh, so mini tests basically was sort of a very not that powerful spectrometer. But it doesn't have to be uh, powerful. Basically, all it is is there to sort of point it at things, and then it analyzes, hmm, that's sort of an interesting target over there. It's telling us it's made up of some interesting uh, elements. We'll go over and take a look at that. So it's basically just sort of a long-range way to find interesting targets for the rover. And then, uh, going sort of to a top-down view over here, there are very clearly a bunch of solar panels on the rover. Uh, that is how the rover generates its power, uh, just from sunlight that hits these solar panels, and um, then generates electricity from that. But also, uh, sort of on the right side here, it's kind of hard to see, there's this thing. Uh, this is yet another antenna. Uh, this one is the UHF antenna. And this one is not used to communicate directly with Earth. Instead, what this one does is it'll send and receive messages to the Mars orbiters that are in orbit around Mars. And then they will relay those messages over to Earth and vice versa. And it turned out this actually was one of the most uh, useful ones uh, towards the end of the missions. They were pretty much almost exclusively using this UHF antenna 
to communicate with the orbiters and have them relay messages because it was just a lot more efficient than having to uh, point that ping pong paddle at Earth or use the low gain antenna as well. Um, anyway, that's the sort of top down view. And then now going focusing on the rover's arm, uh, this is sort of some of the instruments on the arm. There's this thing right here. Uh, this is a drill of sorts. It's called the rock abrasion tool. It's about the size of a soda can, and uh, it's not quite like the drills we use on Earth. It doesn't uh, sort of make a long hole. It makes sort of a wide hole instead. Uh, there are two sort of diamond-tipped things on here that spin around really quickly, and they basically drill in and make a very shallow hole in whatever rock the rover wants to uh, drill into, like so. Uh, this is actually a picture taken by the Spirit rover, but it shows you sort of what I'm talking about here. It'll drill a very shallow hole in here, and then the rover can then analyze that further uh, to see sort of what that's made up of in case it's different uh, underneath the surface of the rock than it is on the surface. So that's the rock abrasion tool. And uh, here's a diagram showing uh, in more detail all of the instruments that are on the rover's hand, so to speak. Uh, there's the rock abrasion tool. And then there are these two things, which are actually both spectrometers as well. This one's called a Mossbauer spectrometer, and this one's an alpha particle X-ray spectrometer. Um, these ones, instead of basically analyzing the spectrum that certain things get off, instead it's a bit more active. Both of these have a little bit amount, a trace amounts of radioactive elements in them. And basically how they work is they get up very close to the rock and they basically irradiate it with um, you know, radiation. And then whatever bounces back sort of tells it what, that, uh, what elements or molecules uh, that particular rock is made of. So there's some very, uh, I'm sure, very particular difference between what a Mossbauer spectrometer does and what alpha particle X-ray spectrometers do. Don't ask me. I don't know it. But um, those are those two things. And then also the fourth one on the side over here is the microscopic imager, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's uh, sort of a tiny microscope, and uh, it would just get up close to rocks and uh, take very, um, it would just zoom in and take microscopic images. So yeah, and that's really it. There are only seven scientific instruments on each rover, and that's kind of shocking because, you know, when you see a lot of these images, especially like, say, uh, with Curiosity, uh, that rover had a whole bunch of scientific instruments on it, but no, this, this rover did not have all that many. Uh, these rovers, I should say, since there are two of them. Only seven scientific instruments. The rest were all just sort of utility. But uh, anyway, those are the instruments on each rover. And Opportunity was launched on July 7th of 2003. Uh, Spirit rover was launched a month earlier, and Spirit launched on a Delta II rocket. Opportunity launched on a Delta II Heavy rocket. In fact, this was actually the first ever use of the Delta II Heavy variant um, for an actual payload. Um, and the reason why it had to go on the Heavy variant is because its launch window was a little bit less ideal than Spirit's. Um, so it had to get a bit of extra energy to make it to Mars. And uh, so therefore it had to use more power, hence this rocket. But uh, first launch of the Delta II Heavy carried opportunity. And uh, that was on July 7th of 2003. And then um, here is a map of Mars. And uh, there are some features, you, you, you probably don't know much of this, but I can point out a few features you might have heard of before. Uh, probably most of you have heard of a thing called Olympus Mons. That's the largest uh, mountain in the solar system. Uh, that is right over here on Mars. That's um, the biggest one of all in the entire solar system. And also there's another one called Elysium Mons over here, uh, which is a little bit smaller, but it's the second largest mountain on Mars, if I'm not mistaken. And then there's this giant thing over here, which is called, um, called well, I seem to have forgotten the name of this thing, but it's basically like the Grand Canyon, but a lot bigger. Maybe someone can help me out on the name if you know it. Thank you. Valles Marineris. It's, it's the giant, also the biggest canyon in the solar system, if I recall. So those are some uh, features on Mars most people have heard of. Uh, opportunity did not go to any of them. It went to a much more boring area called uh, Meridiani Planum, which basically means middle plains in English. Uh, very creative names on Mars, as you'll soon find out. That's where it landed. Um, it's right about, it's very, very close to the equator. I believe that line's actually the equator, so very close there. Also very close to the prime meridian, but of course that doesn't really mean anything. That's just sort of an arbitrary point we decided is the middle longitude. But that's where it landed. And um, 
it had to go through three different phases before it could actually start doing science. Uh, the first of which is atmospheric entry, as you can see here. And uh, basically it came into Mars on an escape trajectory, which basically means if it didn't hit anything, it would keep going and just fly past Mars and then go off into space never to, be, never to return again. But um, basically they didn't want that to happen, and they didn't have enough rocket power to slow it down and have it go into orbit and then deorbit it. So it basically came through and it hit, uh, it didn't hit, but it sort of went into Mars' atmosphere at escape velocity, and then it just had to slow down due to friction with the air in Mars' atmosphere. Now Mars has a lot thinner of an atmosphere than Earth does. It's only about like one or two percent the actual density of Earth, so it had to go in quite a bit lower than it would have been if it was on Earth. But basically, if it went in too shallow, then it wouldn't have slowed down enough and it would have gone off into space again. If it went in too steep, then it would have blown up. So they basically had to find exactly the right trajectory for it to go in on. And uh, also, they had to find exactly the right time for it to go in as well, for it to land in Meridiani Planum, which is where it wanted to go. Um, otherwise, it would have landed in a completely different area of Mars. So a lot of variables they had to take care of. But of course, that's sort of pretty, pretty much every day that NASA does stuff like this. So uh, they got it just right. And, uh, but basically, as it was going through uh, the atmosphere, since it's so hot, you know, it gets thousands of degrees over here, it had to have a heat shield, which is basically a really, really strong um, insulator, a thermal insulator, so that, you know, the rover in here doesn't burn up from the thousands and thousands of degrees, basically fireball out here, so that would uh, protect the rover. And then once it was done going through the fireball phase, once it had slowed down enough, it would eject the heat shield, which is on the other side here, and then it would uh, use a parachute to help it sort of slow down and uh, float, uh, float sort of in relative terms, since it's Mars and their atmosphere is pretty thin, but it would help it slow down as it's going down towards the surface. And then once it gets really close to the surface, it's still going a bit too fast for it to really land safely. So they have these retro rockets, which they would fire, and uh, that would basically slow it down so it's almost hovering. And then the rover would be lowered down to the surface on a cable like this. And you're seeing a bunch of spheres right there. Those are actually airbags that would sort of de uh, deploy at the last second. They would inflate, and then basically they'd cut the cable, and the rover would sort of bounce along the surface like so. Um, until eventually it came to a stop. So this is going at highway speeds when it actually hits the surface. So yeah, this, these airbags are very much needed. But basically bounce, 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 and then eventually come to a stop. Yes? These are all renderings. Yeah, the, the, the rover's in there. Its cameras are sort of covered up, so. Um, that would have been cool, but no. Yeah, no, they're all renderings. Um, I, I actually think when the Curiosity rover landed, uh, one of the orbiters around Mars did actually get a picture of it and its parachute as it was going down. But I don't think they did that for these two. But uh, anyway, um, eventually it would come to a stop, uh, and the airbags would deflate, and then the rover sort of enclosure would open up like this, and uh, then the rover would sort of come out, unfold its solar panels, and then drive out onto the surface. Now you guys might be wondering, well, what happens if it lands on the wrong side? Like, for example, right here it's sort of shown right side up, but what if, say, it lands on that side, or if it lands on that side, what happens? Well, they thought about that, and uh, they decided to put an accelerometer on the rover, which basically it just tells which way is down, and they would decide, okay, I landed on this panel instead. So it would basically open that panel first and keep the other two shut, and then it would sort of force its way over and then flip over onto the right side, and then the other two would open up, and then uh, the solar panels would unfold and the rover could go about its business. So uh, that's how they did that. Um, anyway. The next, uh, so Curi uh, Spirit and Opportunity landed without incident. None of them broke or anything like that. And um, this is about where Opportunity landed. And uh, mission scientists called it the cosmic hole in one. And uh, the reason for that is because uh, when it went down, uh, this is sort of where the heat shield fell off. That's the first thing that they ejected. It landed over here. Um, this is where the uh, rover bounced when its airbags sort of deployed. And uh, then the parachute and the back shell, as, as it uh, dropped the rover, they sort of flew off and landed over here. And so it bounced, 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 and then landed right in there. It landed right in the middle of a crater, and no, it did not create the crater. The crater was already there. It just by chance landed right in the middle of the crater. So it went all the way from space, you know, through the atmosphere, slowed down, parachuted, bounced, and landed right in there. So they called it the hole-in-one because they went all the way from Earth over here and uh, in one shot landed it right in the hole. So that crater, they named it Eagle Crater, and they were not intending 
waiting for that to happen, by the way. Uh, they didn't actually want, they didn't think it was going to land in the crater, but it was kind of convenient that it did. So they called it Eagle Crater. And uh, this is one of the first pictures that Opportunity actually took. Um, this is sort of a panorama of Eagle Crater. And um, there you can see the airbags deflated and the whole landing mechanism has unfolded. And um, some other pictures we have here. Uh, here is one actually of the entire lander assembly. So you can see the rover sort of drove off that way. And uh, you can see some of the tracks it made in the soft soil of the crater there. And um, here are some of the, it turns out, on the rim of Eagle Crater, there were actually a whole bunch of rocks right over here, just sort of rocky outcroppings. And um, some of these proved to be very interesting because uh, here's a picture taken by the microscopic imager um, on that rover's arm of some of the rocky outcroppings there. And uh, there's this little thing right over there. We'll come back to what that is in just a minute, but uh, that will prove to be very, very interesting. But also, some of the rocks in here uh, turned out to be interesting as well, because the uh, spectrometer, the Mossbauer spectrometer, they used it on these, and they detected a mineral called jarosite. And jarosite uh, contains hydro uh, hydroxide ions, turns out that only forms in the presence of liquid water. So already, just a few days into its mission, Opportunity had already found pretty strong evidence for liquid water on ancient Mars. So uh, that was pretty exciting. They had a press conference pretty much immediately to, dis to announce this, hey, we found something. But um, yeah, so that was that. And uh, Opportunity also used its rock abrasion tool here. Um, this is, uh, again, another microscopic uh, picture, but it's showing uh, sort of how it drilled into the rock here. And it found something interesting in here as well. It found uh, these things. Uh, this is what geologists call VUGS, that's V-U-G-S. And basically the way these form is uh, when crystals will sort of form in the rock here. And uh, later on, when erosion happens, they sort of fall out and uh, they leave behind these little cavities. So I found that as well, and that was also pretty interesting. And uh, apologies if I'm sort of speeding through this. I, I do have quite a bit here because the Opportunity rover spent a whole 17, I th no, not 17, uh, 14 or so years on Mars. So there's a lot to cover. But um, it found that. It also found these things, which uh, mentioned scientists named blueberries. Uh, this is an outcropping they named Stone Mountain, and this is a false color image to sort of exaggerate and show you uh, the different colors of these blueberry features. Um, here's a closer up image of these blueberry things. And uh, of course, they're not actually blueberries. They're just rocks, but uh, they called them that. And uh, this was another interesting thing, because they also in investigated the blueberries and found out they are made mostly of hematite. And hematite uh, only forms in the presence of acidic water. So again, more evidence that there was ancient uh, water on ancient Mars. Um, also, uh, opportunity happened to capture a transit of Phobos, which is the largest moon of Mars, as it was going across the sun. So it's not very large, but uh, you can see there goes Phobos. It's sort of like a tiny asteroid-type moon um, as it goes across the sun. So never on Mars will you get a total solar eclipse. This is the best you're going to get. But uh, they do happen uh, once every few days, though. So if you're in the right area, uh, you can see them multiple times. For example, I think the Opportunity rover saw um, this one, and then a couple of days later, it captured another uh, eclipse of, or transit rather, of Phobos across the sun. Uh, and then Mars, uh, the Opportunity rover decided it was going to dig a hole. Um, now, as I went over before, Opportunity only has like spectrometers and a very small drill tool here. It doesn't actually have anything that can really dig into the soil of Mars except for its wheels. And so the, op the drivers basically said, okay, um, take your right front wheel and wiggle it back and forth a bunch of times and have the other wheels hold the rover steady and that should dig a hole. And it did. And what they found was that the soil, uh, and they did this right inside the very sort of bottom of the crater where it was pretty sort of dusty, and what they found was that um, the soil that is underneath, uh, just a few centimeters underneath, was very different from the soil that was on top of the crater. In fact, some of the soil particles underneath there were so fine that the microscopic imager could not even uh, resolve individual particles there. Anyway, um, going on from there, uh, after about, say, a month and a half or so, uh, opportunity decided it was time to leave Eagle Crater. And so here's a pan panorama it took of uh, the landing platform and Eagle Crater. Uh, you can see it's not all that big of a crater. It's only uh, about, like, say, 15, 20 meters across there. 
But uh, yeah, that's a panoramic image it took. And if you look really closely there, there's a little trench that it dug right next to its lander. And uh, from there, it stopped by this little crater called Fram Crater. Uh, it didn't really go into it because it's so small. It just sort of stopped by, took a picture, and then left. And at this point, um, it was about, say, 88 sols, which is a sol is one Martian day. It was 88 sols into its mission when it arrived at Fram Crater. And the original mission for Opportunity was only 90 sols. But at this point, the rover was still working fine, um, and mission scientists basically decided, we're going to extend the mission. And so they did. They extended it from 90 sols up until, I don't know how long they extended it for, but it got several missing extensions. Um, but so the next, uh, the next target it wanted to go to was a crater called Endurance Crater, which is a much bigger crater than Eagle, uh, the one it landed in. So this is a um, picture taken by, I believe, Mars Odyssey, which was one of the orbiters around Mars at the time. And uh, that's where it landed. Uh, you can actually see the rover tracks, or you could if you had higher, uh, better projector here. Uh, there's Fram Crater, and there is actually the rover. It just appears as a tiny little speck, but they're still able to see it from space, which I think is really awesome. And there's Endurance Crater, uh, where it was heading for, so you can see quite a bit larger than uh, the other two that it visited. And uh, eventually made it to Endurance Crater, took this picture, and uh, you can see in the center there, there are some very interesting uh, sand dune formations. It also got a pretty good picture of those. It uh, looks kind of psychedelic, but uh, basically uh, the rover couldn't really go here because these sand dunes are kind of bad for the rover because if it gets stuck in them, um, then it doesn't really have that many ways of getting out except for wiggling its wheels or something like that. So it didn't actually go down in the center to investigate those, even though they, I'm sure they wanted to. Uh, 